Hey, I'm Waldo Jaquith. Uh, I am with the Beck Center uh, at Georgetown, which I joined back in May off just about four years at 18F, uh, the federal government's tech shop. Just a few words about the Beck Center and, and who we are and why we're doing this. The Beck Center is part of Georgetown University. We're um, an experiential hub with two mandates. The first is to be a training ground for students and lifelong learners. Uh, the, the idea is to equip the future global leaders that often seem to come out of Georgetown uh, with the tools and approaches to further the common good. And then the second mandate is to be a catalyst for scalable leading edge ecosystem ideas. So as an organization, we promote outcome driven solutions in these three primary areas, fair finance, data and digital and sustainable student impact. So I work uh, within the data and digital chunk of the Beck Center uh, and uh, also working with me here is uh, Robin Carnahan, uh, my partner in my work here at the Beck Center's State Software Collaborative. And also joining us are two of our longtime coworkers, uh, Mark Hobson and Vicki McFadden of the General Service Administration's 18F. Uh, the four of us work together closely at 18F for the better part of four years. So uh, it's great to have this occasion to all work together again, if briefly, uh, you are no small part gonna be hearing uh, what is basically uh, what 18F has to say. Uh, but as realized through some folks here at the Beck Center and uh, our, our friends from 18F. So thanks for joining everybody. Uh, we are going to talk about a few basic things here. First, we're going to tell you about what's happening today with existing budgeting practices. And then we're going to talk about why that's risky, why the, the status quo uh, isn't safe, but in fact, the, the opposite. Um, and then what we've learned in our work over the past few years on this, and then some recommendations, the things that need to change to make things stop being bad. So to, to start off with what's happening today, uh, Robin, I'm hoping you can say a few words about your own experience with, uh, with lock-in, uh, with, a, with a vendor, given your own background about, um, about why things are going badly. Yeah, thanks very much, Waldo, and thanks everybody for joining us. Um, so yeah, my path to this place, I would never have predicted uh, five or 10 years ago uh, that I would be interested and passionate about government technology. But it turns out uh, when I was in uh, office, I used to be Secretary of State of Missouri, that there was nothing that caused me to lose more sleep than the rollout of some new tech project. And it was always over budget or past due or just didn't work. And I had to like publicly explain why that was and always felt like a complete goat for not, you know, using taxpayer dollars better, but I wasn't a technologist and I was dependent on vendors that we had hired to do things. And it turns out after I dug into this a lot that our interests weren't always aligned. And you might not find that hard to believe, but in government, like that's a thing. And so I started diving into this a little bit more as I left office and had time to sort of think about some of these things more and wondered why uh, this was happening and whether if it was just something that happened to me. And as I talked to elected officials and government leaders around the country, it turned out that like the dirty little secret is the technology keeps them all up at night and that this is a thing that everybody wishes was less risky. And so as I dug into it more, I thought about sort of my own experience and it turned out the thing that was just really bad is that we couldn't share anything. We couldn't, we're all in the same business of delivering services to the public and using taxpayer money to do that. And yet we're just always over and over again, buying the same thing and dependent on vendors to get it right. And my own experience was with that. Uh, I had uh, early in my days uh, inherited um, the use of an online business registration and licensing system which was fantastic. The Secretary of State in North Carolina had hired a couple of people to do this for her state. And my predecessor in office, when she offered it up for free because the taxpayers in North Carolina had already built it, said yes and implemented this in my state. And so when I got into office and we was a different party than me too, so none of this is partisan, uh, I just built on that and just decided to go all in on doing online business filings. And it turns out the public loves to be able to do that. It's cheaper, it's faster, it's better and takes less staff time. And so this was all going well and I'd travel the state and people would say, hey, this is great, we love this. And the legislature went along and they loved it too. And it was just felt like progress. And then one day what happened was that the guys in North Carolina that built this sold their business. 
to a really big vendor who within six months decided they weren't gonna support the platform again. That we'd have to go to an RFP, even though we had something that was working great that we were gonna have to spend tens of millions of dollars to, do, to start over again. And I thought it was ridiculous and didn't understand why this had to happen and pushed back hard and was told there was really no choice and we had to do it. So we went through the whole procurement process and I didn't pay much attention because just like everybody else, when I hear the word procurement, my, my eyes get sort of sleepy and I think that this is something I shouldn't have to pay attention to. Well, it turns out all the problems boil down to procurement. I learned this and that's what we wanna talk about today. Because once you get locked into a vendor and you procure a solution, but don't own it or understand it fully in-house, you can't do your mission. And so that's why we're all here. That's what we talked about a lot at 18F is how to help state and local governments as well as the federal government be smarter about how they buy technology, not to be dependent on vendors who don't always have the public interest or your interest at heart um, and that we can share and learn from each other. So I'm super excited to be here today. I've become a procurement nerd, I'm like happy to say, and we have some of the best in the in the government procurement business on this call today. So who's next? Are you gonna talk, you're gonna get us really excited now, right, Mark? I, I, I wanna hear from Mark uh, talking about how we got in this crazy system that we have right now of these huge long-term contracts. I mean, given the lofty ideals of your uh, center, what a letdown to bring me into this. Good Lord, <laughs> these students. Oof, they're going to give up any idea of leadership after this. So uh, for all of you out there, um, my name is Mark Hobson. Uh, I had the misfortune of actually being an attorney before I joined government. And it all went downhill from there because somebody said, well, you like law and conflict. You should do this government contracting thing because that's all it is. And when I first started as a, a doe-eyed, uh, young, naive government service, uh, civil servant, who uh, thought that, oh yeah, it's definitely like the West Wing. It's not at all like the West Wing. Um, one of the things that kept happening uh, as I was working on all of these IT systems is that they kept failing and we kept giving a ton of money to them. So I kind of went nuts for a while and decided to try to figure out why that was happening. And it starts out with a little company you all may have heard of before called Kodak. Uh, it was, the year was 1989. I have a lot of inappropriate references that I can put you in the context of the 80s if you weren't around during that time, but just look it up on YouTube or watch Miami Vice and you'll get a sense of what that era was like. It was nuts. One of the things that happened was this little company called Kodak, which was in this thing called print photography said, well, this is never going away. We are the biggest print photography business in the world and it's never ever gonna change ever. So let's just keep doing that. And look at all these people we've got in this computer stuff with this information technology and these servers and everything. We don't need that. We're a print film company. We should get rid of these people. How can we do that? Well, they said, uh, we're gonna do a contract. So here's the other dirty secret. Whenever somebody says procurement or contracting, that's just company manners for what's actually going on, which is outsourcing. We're talking about outsourcing because before Kodak said we need to get rid of this and outsource it from the company, they did everything in-house and they decided to outsource to another little company you may have heard of called International Business Machines or IBM. Now, when they did this in the 80s, it was heralded as just visionary, huge success. It, you can go back and look at every cover of every CIO magazine, business magazine. They were heralded as geniuses for cost cutting, for innovation. Uh, so then all the other Fortune 500 companies said, we're going to do that too. And oh boy, was that a mistake. Because when they started to copy that business model, they discovered a few things very quickly. And I call it the Kodak curse. Because everybody who copied that model of outsourcing might as well have been cursed by King Tut's tomb. Because here's what ended up happening. When you outsource like that, you end up having to go with one company because people say, well, I can't have multiple companies do it. That would be crazy. How would you ever track anything that happens? You do it for a long period of time to recover the savings from the arrangement and you do it for huge swaths of your business. Now that usually means that you end up with a contract to outsource your IT to somebody for five or more years for hundreds of millions of dollars. And these CIOs used to brag because the contracts were so long and so voluminous 
that they could be measured in linear feet and they would actually have to stand on step ladders like some guys would brag about standing on a step ladder to sign their contract away to to IBM uh well when they did that uh, about year five of people doing that right at the apex of where they were supposed to have cost savings people discovered that they were slower to market for their products and services the cost was going up not down and the quality was going down from their providers and by 1993-95 most of the companies that had entered into these five or ten year long contracts to outsource their it uh killed them or gave it off because they were like this isn't going to work at all and then it's true because Gartner wrote a book about it and came up with the term, so you know it's real. It's called multi-sourcing, which ruled from about the mid nineties up until the invention of the little computer that some of you may be watching this on that uh, they put in your pocket there. Then what happened is everybody figured out, well, now we need to go back to that insourcing thing because we need to be quicker and cheaper. That means insourcing. Now the government is like a very large ship. It doesn't turn on a dime. And so usually whatever is happening in the private sector, the government will catch up on. Unfortunately, the government has not caught up on that. So they kind of do multi-sourcing, but most likely or not, you're usually going to find a government agency with an IT system outsourcing like Kodak. They follow this model. And that's because of a few unique circumstances to the government that I call the devil's pitchfork, which has three prongs, contracting, HR, and IT. So that's kind of what's been going on. And Walt is gonna talk a little bit more about when you follow that model, what happens? Because it's not just a matter of, well, we need to make sure that we've got the latest and greatest software and tech stacks, and we need to have APIs and all the good stuff about how these, how these light boxes work. It's not just that, it's the business arrangements. It's the incentive structure. It's how you're able to actually maintain any kind of control. But the government kept doing that Kodak model, which was really something called outsourcing your core competency. So, Walter, why don't you tell us a little bit about how well that's been working for government so far? Well, can you tell us how that worked out for Kodak? Uh, well, as you all know now, they're in big pharma. So that print film hit them like a T-bone at a highway stop. Uh, that, it turned out that they were really wrong about that. And uh, when they had outsourced all of their people that knew how computers work, it turned out for digital film, that was a catastrophe. And they never, ever recovered but uh, now they're going to do pharmacy stuff. So we've got that going for us. Their logic seems to be, the first mistake they made was thinking, we're in the print photography business instead of, no, we're in the business of recording images and allowing people to disseminate them. And they're doubling down. They're like, well, we're in the chemical business, I guess. Like, no, man, <laughs> what are you doing, Kodak? Yeah, it's a, a sad, story, sad story for Kodak. Um, but the shame is that the federal government learned entirely the wrong lesson at the wrong moment that like, they never updated their knowledge about this. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about why, why this is risky or really like catalog some of the ways in which th this, is, this is risky. And the, like the canonical example of this and some of y'all's eyes are gonna, gonna roll back in your heads when you hear this because you're sick of hearing about it. But other than this new is healthcare.gov. The Affordable Care Act, that passed into law. Uh, but a really, really important part of the Affordable Care Act uh, was that this is website, healthcare.gov that you'd go to to be able to sign up for healthcare. Day one of this site launching, I've seen the number, it's like three people or something <laughs> managed to use this website to sign up for healthcare. Millions of people were trying, but the site just crumbled, which was uh, mystifying to Health and Human Services, who had spent over a billion dollars to CGI Federal, a huge vendor in this space, to build a website that needed to work on day one. And they've been getting reports all along from the vendor saying, everything's good, we're in good shape, boss, no problem, this is going to go great. And then it was a disaster. And the question, of course, had to be, well, why was it a disaster? What happened? How do we keep that from happening again? Um, but an uh, uh, important part of this is that the report said that everything was working great, that there was no risk associated with this, uh, and they outsourced everything to one company. Now, CGI Federal didn't do all the work. They outsourced it to, com to other companies who outsourced it to other companies. Everybody all along the way said this was safe, but it was, in fact, really really unsafe. And what it reminds me of is just a couple of years before when the economy collapsed and part of these, in, in part because of these collateralized debt obligations, where people were getting insurance policies on bundles of mortgages as to whether they would fail. So even if they failed, it's okay, we have an insurance policy. But everybody had the same insurance policy from the same company. 
that was basically ensuring all the value of all the houses in America many, many, many times over. They didn't possibly have the money for, but they felt they controlled the risk. They didn't and the economy collapsed. Kind of similar deal here. And when the healthcare.gov website didn't work in really substantial part, the Affordable Care Act wasn't working. We had a, a really important case here. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, that uh, link, Robin, on the, uh, in the IG report, the um, Inspector General Report on healthcare.gov. It's actually really interesting. Like, I, people kept telling me to read this. Like, I'm not gonna read Inspector General. It sounds super boring. I'm not gonna read that. No, it's really compelling. Um, and the reason this is really important is it was the first really high profile case of a major government program failing for reasons of technology. The, the realization here, the realization for why te the, these technology failures are so risky, going all the way back to the budgeting process, is that if the technology fails, if the website doesn't work, the program doesn't work, the governance doesn't work, doesn't get off the ground. So it may not shock you to learn that uh, these big uh, government projects, basically when you spend more than $6 million on a big uh, custom government software thing, 13% uh, succeed. Failure is totally normal. And every yeah. agency and state thinks they're especially terrible, but they're not, everybody fails. In fact, during healthcare.gov, healthcare.gov was just the first one where people in the mainstream paid attention. There were three other healthcare.gov size systems at federal agencies that were failing at the same time in big ways, in huge scandals, but they didn't get nearly as much press coverage. And you can still go back to the era and find things like Social Security Administration spent over $300 million on a modernization boondoggle. So they were all happening because again, as Waldo said, if the success rate is 13%, nobody's doing this well. It's a proven failure, but people keep saying, well, let's just go down this dark path that doesn't look like it's going anywhere. And there's a whole bunch of like bad signs saying, turn around and abandon it. But here we are. And it's this sort of failure is totally normal. And everybody thinks they're especially bad, but every every state, we, we work with a bunch of states, every state has their own version of healthcare.gov. And they all think, well, how embarrassing for us. No, every state has these. This is just how it goes. Federal government alone spends $90 billion a year on IT. And about 80% of that is maintenance of legacy systems that report after report from inspectors general have found these legacy systems are out of date, inflexible, expensive, and ineffective. And more and more of the budget every year for IT is going to maintaining these gnarly old systems. Now, important point about these 13% that are a success, they're not, that's that success based on cost schedule and performance. That doesn't mean that they meet the user's needs. You can build a big government system that comes in within budget, that comes in within schedule, and that ticks all the boxes for what it's supposed to do, but the boxes weren't based on what people actually need. So you wind up with a success that in fact is a total flop. And it's my experience that very few of those 13% actually do solve users' needs. So I'll, I'll give, you, give you one more story to, to wrap up here on um, why all this is so risky. Unemployment insurance. We all saw beginning in April, April and May were like, and May were hell months for state employment agencies. And, and Robin and I have, have done a bunch of work. I know Vicky's been doing some work too um, with state employment agencies in which they had these pretty gnarly old systems for UI, but like they worked, but they worked when you got thousand claims a week, maybe a really bad spike of, you know, a couple few thousand claims a week. But instead, these were cataclysmic numbers and they were nowhere near being able to handle what actually happened. Now, there's an argument to be made that why should they engineer these systems for something that has never happened before? Okay. But it's certainly within the realm of possibility that a whole bunch of people can be laid off all at once and you might have to deal with that. And they weren't even close. It wasn't like they were 90% of the way or 50% of the way there. They had like five, they still have like 5% of the capacity necessary to deal with all of these claims that still in, that, 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 that came in. Many states, most I think, are still dealing with a backlog. There are people who applied for unemployment back in April who still don't have it. And, and that's not uh, just a statistic. Like, those are individuals who are losing their homes, who are relying on increasingly thinly stretched food banks to be able to feed families. Like it's really grim. And so the, the risks here are not just, ah, system didn't work. Ah, what are you gonna do? We didn't expect it. The risks are millions of people's lives are uh, seriously 
damaged or threatened as a result of the impact of this. So Vicki, could you talk a bit about um, what we've learned in all of our work on this about uh, what, where this stuff comes from and um, uh, what are le lessons learned basically? Yeah, happy to. Um, so Robin talked about outsourcing your mission, right? And expecting industry to deliver upon that. Um, we've learned that that's in a really risky way of delivering services to your users as a government agency. Um, ultimately, it is the agency's mission and that risk, if they fail, cannot be outsourced. Um, it will be the agency on the front page of the Washington Post or whatever if their, um, their contract fails and they're not able to deliver their services. And so it's really risky to try and outsource your mission. Um, these, Mark talked about contract sizes of 10 years for duration and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, that's very risky as well. And so what we have been advocating for the last several years is to bring in some of that ownership in-house and to reduce those contract sizes to something that's under a couple of million dollars um, and usually have periods of performance of no longer than three years. Um, and we have been working with agencies over the last few years to try and pilot moving away from these large contracts, um, typically what agencies would do is they would get a big pot of money, hundreds of millions of dollars in some cases to deliver something. Okay, so this is the budget that we've received. And that means we have to spend this whole budget with one contractor because doing contracting is really hard. And what we've heard again and again is that um, agencies would diligently go off and come up with every possible requirement that they might have for what this new system needs to do, detail those requirements in these really prescriptive statements of work outlining specifically how this, this uh, system will function. The contract value would be hundreds of millions of dollars and would need lots of levels of approval because it is so large. And those approvals sometimes would take two or more years before the contract would even be competed and awarded and the vendor starts work. So spending years detailing requirements that will change is, is nuts, right? Um, policies will change, the technology landscape will change, user needs will change. And so the whole process that government was doing was just sort of like upside down, just totally crazy. And so what we've been doing is working with agencies and we've been doing a bunch of workshops. The four of us have probably done 20 of them together. Um, and it basically it's telling agencies that instead of doing these hundreds of millions of dollars of one contract, let's figure out a slice of functionality that will deliver some value to your users and let's award a smaller contract to one vendor to do that slice. And then let's figure out what the next slice is down the future and award that to another vendor. That way, if one contractor vendor fails, it's not sinking the entire ship, right? Um, and the nice thing with modern technology is you can make these pieces work together very easily through application programming interfaces and other things. So the technology components are easy. It's just getting government to shift their mindset away from awarding these large contracts. Um, and we've been advocating for using agile and human-centered design to drive these works. And then in Scrum, there's this concept of a product owner. Um, and this person, we advocate for them to be a government employee because they are the one that's setting the direction for the team and they're the one that is accepting work on behalf of the government. And so no longer is government just getting these monthly red, yellow, green stoplight charts saying that we're performing or not. Um, they're actively involved in the development. They see what's happening every day. They're seeing functioning code that they can deliver to users every two weeks. Um, it's a big paradigm change. Um, and we've seen a lot of success with this approach. Um, one agency through a handful of workshops, we were able to do something like $1 billion in cost avoidance based on what they were planning on spending for some large IT systems and getting them to change the way that they were going to approach those systems resulted in a huge cost avoidance. Um, so we've been cataloging our, a lot of our learnings in these de-risking guides. I'll throw them in the chat here, but I think we, we just wanna- Just put the link in. Cool, thank you. Um, but I think we wanna drill in deeper on some of the specifics um, that we, we've learned about. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, um, to talk just for a minute about um, how we found that this goes back to the budgeting process. Um, uh, Robin, yeah, would, would you mind saying a few words about, yep. we thought this was like a, a tech problem and then we thought it was a procurement problem and now we think it's a budgeting problem. 
Yeah. So when you when you keep asking why is it this way, uh, why why are these failures there? We go to procurement, and why is procurement the way it is? Uh, that you only have these giant contracts. It's because it's such a pain. Uh, and why is it such a pain? And why are the contracts so big? And it's because they it takes so long to get money through the budget cycle. Um, it could take it could take you know two or three years to get the request through just to get the just to get the budget to start on the project. And you've already committed to what that project looks like on the front end. And so. I often say that we are treating um, infrastructure, the sort of technical infrastructure of our government and building it and paying for it and budgeting for it in the same way we do a bridge, right? We think that's this giant big project that's gonna cost $100 million and then you get to just like patch it up for the next 30 or 40 years and keep using it, but it's fundamentally not gonna change. And the key, the key mental shift here is to help the budgeting folks understand and, and the, the mission agencies, that that's not how software works, that it's not going to be a thing that is constant for the next 30 years. If it is, it's not going to be serving people well and can't respond to, as Vicki said, all the changes that we know are coming. And so instead, we need to think of it like a puppy. Software is more like a puppy that's cheaper to get into in the front end, but that you have to like keep feeding and nurturing and going to take your time and attention in order for it to behave and like be the partner you want it to be. So what that means is you want to have smaller and more predictable budget authorizations rather than these giant, big, monolithic contracts. And the more we can educate budget authorities about that and to give flexible money so that when things go well on a $1 million or 2 or $5 million contract, that it's easy to get the next $5 million without having to wait four or five more years to be able to get it. And that that guide that Vicky mentioned that I, I posted the link to in the chat, that catalogs in great detail we're talking about. It's broken down into state and federal components because there's different approaches for budgeting to each of those. So if any of y'all want to go in deep, you can read those. It's been it's basically a best of document of stuff written by a whole bunch of people at 18F, mostly for clients that uh, Vicki and Mark were able to shepherd into this one big document and make public. Uh, Cause it really, it's pretty great to take all the stuff that h has learned and be able to expose it to the public and say, here's how you do this stuff. Uh, but the focus on there is on the whole budgeting process. So I'd like to, to wrap up the part where we talk at y'all here with recommendations. We're just gonna go real quick and go through, each of us are gonna talk about some specific recommendations we wanna make about how to do this stuff better. Uh, to make it possible to budget and then execute on that budgeting effectively uh, for these big software projects. Uh, Vicki, can you start us off with bringing ownership back in-house? Yeah, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, government is used to just saying, here's a big pot of money and a bunch of really detailed requirements, go off and do your thing and deliver it to us in five years or 10 years, right? And that can't work anymore. That has been proven again and again to not work. Um, it's the government's mission. They have to stay involved in the development. They need to see functioning software delivered every two weeks to users. Um, and the only way that that's made possible is by having an empowered product owner, a single government employee who is part of the scrum team that is delivering software, um, that is uh, setting the priorities, that maintains the vision, that is accepting work on behalf of the government. Um, and it's hard for government to make that shift, right? These people don't exist in droves in government today. Um, it's something someone can be trained to do. We've had a lot of luck at agencies of people stepping into these roles, um, but they have to be empowered, right? You're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna stub your toe along the way. You're, it's a hard shift to move from, you know, traditional waterfall project management to something like agile human-centered design product ownership. And so these people need to be able to have time and space to make mistakes and someone that is a government employee has to play in that role. Um, so that's, that's the main shift there. And it's one of the hardest things that we see agencies have to make um, because it's, it's changing people's jobs, right? And there's a lot of ramifications there in terms of changing position descriptions and taking other things off their plate so they can be successful in this role. Um, but it's one of the main things that 18F advocates for when working with an agency. And the alternative is to have that position live within the vendor, which means if you need to let that vendor go, if they're not performing, you lose all of your knowledge about that system that's being built. 
and the next vendor can't pick up where the last one left off because you don't know anything about it. And so you're stuck with that old vendor. Um, so I mean, there's a bunch of benefits as Vicky has talked about to bringing that ownership in house, but um, I, I think that's a, that's a big one. Robin, can you talk to us about spending less money through better budgeting? So, yeah, so this is one of the biggies is like, no one will believe you when you say that you're going to get better results with less money because no one's ever heard that before. Um, and so kind of breaking through on, on that is a big deal. And why, why is that the case? Well, it's the case because if it's a big contract, you just have a couple of vendors who are ever going to bid on that. Um, I think Waldo's mentioned the 13% success rate on contracts over $6 million. Uh, I, I believe that same study showed that there were only about 10 or 12 companies that ever bid, ever bid on an IT contract over $10 million. So just by making it big, you've limited the pool of competition. And most of those, most of those companies are not the ones that are also providing standard commercial services out in the marketplace. So to me, a lot of this comes down to baking more competition into the process so that as the government owner and responsible person for a project, you can switch out a vendor, you can have competition, you can have the best of breed and the private sector also do these contracts for government. And so you do that by making these smaller and easier contracts to get into that don't, don't require lots of you know, performance bonds and all kinds of other things that, that smaller companies don't have. The other thing is, I just mentioned again, my whole bridge and puppy analogy is the sooner we can like get people to stop thinking of IT expenses as oper as as, oper of, as capital expenses like a bridge, and think of them instead as operating expenses because they're always going to be necessary. Uh, the quicker we're going to be able to make that shift to smaller contracts and less money. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it was it was a it was a journey for us to figure out. This goes back to budgeting. Uh, I hope that's as far back as this goes because we've been tracing this thing for a year. Oh God, Mark shaking his head. I don't want to hear about it now, Mark. I want to feel like we've really solved something. <laughs> Mark, could, could you talk about um, reducing contract sizes and 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 how you how you do that? Yeah, I mean, you should really read the guide to get in there because it, it's decades of learning. But part of the issue is also there's a chicken and an egg problem. It's not uncommon to come across an agency that has not just a contractor in terms of a company, one of the big ones like Robin mentioned, because they're the only ones capable of performing at this level, but the literal contractors have been working on a contract for a system for more than three decades because I've seen it, it's real. And it blew my mind. I was like, what and, do you And mean? if you award the new contract <laughs> right. to somebody they're, else, they're where do those vendors go? Yeah, or they go right back over there. So it's like, yeah, I've been supporting this system since 1983. I was like, what? What do you mean supporting it? And they've literally been working on the system since 1983. And they're just hired by the new vendor that gets the contract. You yeah. get some new vendor, it's the same humans in the same seats doing the same work. And it's weird What's because the point then, of that? And it's weird because then it's like, well, we built it on a mainframe, but we added web apps. And when you look at the web apps, it's like looking at an old Nintendo emulator. It's the exact same. It's just on the internet now. It's like, great, I've got the mainframe on the internet. I didn't change the UI, I didn't change anything. It's just a mainframe on the internet. Fantastic. Um, so there's a couple different things here. Uh, the, it, it's not just reducing the size because there's a risk profile. Like we treat it kind of like a risk profile. I'm not saying you're gonna fail. I'm just saying you're likely gonna fail. Uh, the UK government also figured this out through uh, like some black swan mathematics. And you can actually find a few talks about it where they literally say you create this long tail of risk. So when you make the contracts this size, when there is a failure, it's the difference between taking a car and driving it into the wall once at 50 miles an hour versus taking a car and running it into a wall 50 times at one mile an hour. The impact of the, the, impact of the failure there of hitting the wall is catastrophic if you're doing it once at 50 miles an hour. So by making the contract smaller, math, it's a magical thing. I went to law school for a reason, folks. It's not because I know how it works. But by making the contract smaller, you're making the risk impact for each of them much, much less than what happened in things like healthcare.gov, where you wait for several years, you've got one thing, and it's like, well, I hope you didn't need that on time. Um, and there's a lot of easy things to do that with. So most of the state governments 
are all aping the federal government's laws about how contracts should work. And that good book is called The Federal Acquisition Regulation. It's about uh, 1,200 pages. So if you're looking for something to you know, start a fire with, keep a door open, it's a fantastic book. They print it on very, very thin paper and they put it on the internet and you can't find anything because the sites are always going down. But the whole point of that is that it lets you do whatever you want. So the biggest shift is not just making the contract smaller to reduce the impact of risk. It's also the fact that we use performance-based contracting, which has been around for 30 years. But some of the things that we do are, hey, instead of us telling you in this long inventory wish list of all the things that'd be nice to have, that also is two years out of date because it took us a year and a half to catalog everybody in the agency what they would like the system to do and put it in like they're Moses telling the Red Sea to part, the system shall, the system shall. Why don't we describe what we want to see happen and then leave it up to the experts to actually build the sucker, which are the people doing the software development. Otherwise, it's like me going to my doctor's office and saying, well, I've got a cough, time to crack open my chest and do open heart surgery. Like I'm not a doctor, I can control my medical decisions, but I shouldn't be controlling my medical diagnosis and care. That's what you leave up to the doctors. But the government writes contracts in a way that says, I have no idea what this is. You will do this in this exact way. So it really is just asking for trouble. So the shifts that we made were not just reducing the size of the contracts, but changing the way we ask industry to do something. And once you combine those two things, you get people that aren't just used to the same thing as always. People that have never bid on a government contract can now play in that space because we lower the barrier to entry and we make it less esoteric for them. So those are the big shifts that you can do. And as Vicky mentioned, and, and I think others will get into like Waldo next about how it's not just we, we made it smaller because software doesn't cost that much. It doesn't. But it's also that you're buying professional services. So you give people the freedom across the infrastructure and the technology stack in a small way to start doing some explore, exploration and risk mitigation around what is actually going on with this thing that we've inherited from 1983 that somebody's been working on in a mainframe for 20 years. Like, how are we gonna actually modernize this? Because there's a window right now, the government's technology landscape generally is stuck in the 80s where everybody's still rolling up their blazer sleeves. And as people try to migrate into cloud infrastructures, this is the time where they actually can refactor this stuff to do it the right way. So Waldo, talk about how the light boxes work and how we don't use telegrams. <laughs> the, the, we used to use we'll, telegrams up to like four years ago for solicitations, we'll, by the way. We'll just do two, two quick things uh, to wrap up recommendations. Vicky's gonna talk about user-centered design and then I'll, I'll talk about agile in uh, broad strokes. Yeah, another thing we see government agencies doing a lot when they move to agile is they start all of the practices, but they don't really internalize what it's about. And user-centered design is a really key component of doing agile well in government. There aren't these predetermined requirements. What you're doing is going off and talking to real end users constantly, getting insights from them about what would make their jobs easier, um, how would they would like these benefits delivered, right? And then you go and build a thing, and then you come back and show it to them and you just repeat that forever. <laughs> um, you can't do user-centered design by talking to people who used to have this job or used to need this benefit 20 years ago, right? It's not the opinions of the highest paid person in the building, it's really talking to end users. And that's another thing that we see government agencies stumbling on is that they, um, they kind of fake that through their agile processes. Um, Waldo, hit on agile. Yep. We'll, we'll round the horn here with Agile and then, and then turn to questions. So Agile software development, what is that? So it, use it, like, please, for the love of God, use it. Like it's what the overwhelming majority of the, I think it's 80 something percent of private sector developers use Agile software and it, uh, methodology. And it's just a way of building software. It's real easy. And this, the vendor delivers functioning, documented, tested software every two weeks. You don't wait years to see if it's any good. At two weeks into the contract, you get delivered software, super crude, but you have it and you can use it and say, all right, this does a thing, great. And every two weeks, it should do more and more. And every two weeks to what Vicky was just talking about, you put that software in front of the actual users and have them use it and see if it meets their needs. And once it meets a baseline of their needs, cool, they can start using it, you can switch to it. It doesn't matter that it's not done, software is never done. They can start using it and then you just give them improvements every couple of weeks. And you just repeat this forever until you run out of money or all the user needs are met, whichever comes first. 
um, the user needs will never be met because um, things change. But a great thing about this is this means that there's constant oversight of the vendor teams. So the, the normal process of providing oversight of whether vendors are doing something is they guess you give a report every few months. You read the report and the report, you're like healthcare.gov says everything's going great. It's not going great. So don't get reports. Reports are a waste of time. Look at the software. And that's what you can do with agile software development. So we just recap. We've gone over uh, what we recommend to be able to get budgeting all the way down, working better. You got to bring ownership back in house. You got to spend less money through better, better budgeting. You need to reduce contract sizes and associated spending. Use user-centered design, also called human-centered design, and use uh, agile software development, or rather have your vendors do that. We've had a couple of questions come in. So uh, what the heck, let's just dive in. Uh, from Erica, Erica asks, how does the size uh, small or getting, getting smaller of tax revenue base play into this problem? That has Robin written all over it. Yeah, so I, I have uh, watched with much interest uh, during the, the pandemic to see that so many state and local governments in particular are trying to leverage uh, what other governments have done rather than starting from scratch, which is fantastic when it comes to this. And the budget constraints that you mentioned are really real. Every, every government at every level is trying to figure out how to balance budgets and are having to make huge cuts. But we know at this time of the pandemic, like transitioning to remote services and digital services isn't even a choice, it's mandatory. Like we can't be safe and we can't provide government functions without doing that. So it's this real dilemma, right? Where there has to be more time and money invested in these uh, technologies and yet there's no money to do it. So for me, it seems like the perfect time to begin teaching folks and uh, encouraging them to do small things that add real value uh, and understanding that they can do that for a lot less money. So it, to me, that it, it, uh, this is sort of a moment in time that we should be able to make good on this transition. Thanks. Uh, and y'all, if you have questions, drop them in. We got till the, till the top of the hour here. Uh, second question and final question that's come in is from Alex who asks, what do you all think of managed service contracts where the government pays for certain outcomes like the number of documents with data extracted or the number of decisions made with a certain accuracy rate rather than the labor of tech folks from vendors. So you're paying for outcomes instead of time, basically. Can these type of contracts align incentives between gover uh, government and vendors effectively? Mark, that's you. Nope. No, it can't. Thank Need you. more Alex. words about that's it. Excellent. That's an excellent question, Alex. And no, it absolutely cannot. Well, there's a couple things there. So first, but Mark, it sounds, it sounds so good. I know. That's what they hope. That's what they hope to trick you with. So there actually are a few companies that take this question to the extreme. Uh, especially at the state and local level. They've tried it a few times at the federal level and everybody goes, no, that's nuts. Because there's a few things here. One, you would have to know what those service levels need to be. And to do that, you would need to engage in things like human-centered design and user experience research to even know that. It then assumes that you're able to change and tune that perfectly. So the, at the state level, what ends up happening is there's an actual mechanism whereby they will totally outsource it to a vendor. And so you will might, for example, see certain um, state very popular to do with, with example, hunting and fishing license permitting systems. They go, hey, you want a fishing license? Here you go. And you go to the website and it's not run by the government. It's run by a private company that then recoups the fee by charging you money to get your license. Now you've already paid tax money to get the license. And yes, you might have to pay an additional fee, but you're effectively giving that now to a private company to access the commons, which is a public resource. That's a whole different thing, but no, you can't. And I've seen a lot of agencies try to align the incentives and people get way, way overboard with how to do that. But effectively the method that we're talking about is you have that empowered product owner and you can't outsource the wrong thing. So when you're dealing with that kind of, that managed service, I've seen a lot of them go awry because they're very easy to game, especially because the nature of contracting tries to create a snapshot in time. So we do do things in our method where we are using what's called a statement of objectives rather than a statement of work. Because with that, we can actually have high level goals 
and we tie it into something uh, called the product vision for whatever that system or service needs to be. And we found over time that that works to get to what I think the value of your question's going for, as opposed to a, a blunter way that has not worked before in the past with people that have tried it. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I hope that answered your question. Alex is certainly a very direct, <laughs> direct answer. Uh, we have a question from uh, Catherine who asks, how would you approach talking to new partners who are generally open-minded, but everything you're talking about is totally new to them, aside from giving them our, our de-risking guide? Any tips to avoid a situation where people think this is just one approach versus this is the best practice way to do it? Um, Vicki, can, can you say a few words about that? Yeah, one thing that we uh, usually emphasize when we start with an agency is like, how well has it been working for you today on the practices you're using? And um, a lot of times that opens up a really good conversation with the agencies about, you know, uh, it's not. And uh, we've had some agencies say, look, I'm tired of having the same problems. I want new problems. And in that case, we get really excited because those are the people we want to work with because Agile and human-centered design don't make everything go perfectly. And it won't be an easy shift for the government agency to do because they need to rethink how they report on initiatives, what the governance process is, what the funding approvals will be. Um, so it won't be easy, but there'll be new problems, right? And your chances of success will be higher. Um, and so we usually talk about it in terms of approaching things and uh, today's not working, let's try something new. Can we start somewhere small, right? don't give us your biggie, biggest, hairiest, most technically complex vendor lock-in scenario as your first initiative. Let's find somewhere small to start um, and start delivering some value and build some goodwill and, um, and trust within the organization around these practices um, early in an engagement. And so that's usually what we end up doing is like, let's not move an entire enterprise to agile overnight. That doesn't work. <laughs> um, so let's start small, start delivering and uh, build some alignment um, and we've had people who were pretty strong naysayers on these topics at the beginning of an engagement um, really see the light um, once that user value starts getting delivered quickly. Yeah, and I just wanted to add to that because um, it is Georgetown. So I was gonna get an exorcist reference in here somewhere. It's not that dissimilar to the exorcist. Uh, you're also all, a lot of you are probably- Let's see where students. this is going. Uh, exactly. A lot of you are also students. So uh, when you're at the library looking for stuff to look up, uh, we've borrowed a lot of methods from intervention theory from other disciplines unrelated to technology because most of these problems come down to human problems because people are people no matter where they are. So we've actually borrowed a lot from intervention, adjacent intervention theory research. We consider things like is this situation ripe for being able to have this conversation where we very frequently will work with an agency at the state, local, or federal level, and they, we, they think they're ready, but they actually are not. So the most successful things we've had are with agencies or folks in those agencies who are coming off of having their hand burnt by grabbing the pot too quickly. They thought they were going to do a big modernization or the, the situation that Robin just described, like they need to have experienced a little bit of failure to have an understanding of what they need to do and be willing to try something different. And as Vicki said, like one of the things that we do, it's not very fancy, but in the old world, pre-pandemic, this was easier. We've now done it virtually a few times. We would just lock everybody in a room. Uh, it's a very old style way of resolving disputes and conflicts, but we start by saying, hey, everybody who can say no has to show up for the next three days, get it out, and we promise you by the end of it, and that's the model, the workshop that Vicky was mentioning that this, uh, the de-risking guide came out of, we just started saying, we're going to lock you in a room for three days, we're going to hash all of this out, anybody who can say no, show up, and we'll do it now and we'll leave you with something that you're ready to put out to get a team in to start building. Um, and those are really fun. You've got to be willing to have very awkward conversations and, and create, it's a very dynamic social situation, but nine times out of 10, it goes well in all of the right ways, in ways that really are unexpected. Um, there's one workshop I'm thinking of in particular where somebody said, well, we can't, like, we're never going to be able to do this because this person from this department will never let us do it. And we brought that person in and they were like, oh, I love this. You should absolutely do it. 
And so like they kept trying to come up with ways to like stop it from happening. And after that workshop, they actually had to spend a month socializing it amongst their executives and leadership. And they had to keep going on essentially a road tour because they would go and brief somebody like the CIO, hey, we had this big thing we were gonna do, we're gonna do this instead. And they're like, well, what are you like, are you done? They're like, no, because they had spent almost a year just trying to write the document for people to bid on. And we had done it in three days. And like, what do you mean you're done? Like, oh no, we're done. We're like, we're ready to release it. So they had to spend a month getting people comfortable with what had just happened. So it's a lot of fun if you wanna to try to do this work. Robin, do you want to say a few words to wrap this up? Um, I, I wanted to actually respond to Catherine's question, uh, which is how do you get folks who kind of know they want to do something different, but don't know how to get started and whether it just feels all risky. Um, it's, it's worth remembering that like what you do with government too much of the time is you manage risk and you're trying to reduce the risk. And particularly in tech projects, they feel totally risky. They feel like there's no upside, that it's only downside risk for everybody involved in it because you're afraid you're gonna you know, look, look bad. Um, the way you convince your, your leadership and your teams is to convince them that this is less risky, that they can actually deliver something of value for a lot less money and know quickly if it's going off the rails and, and get it back on track. Um, and so for, for the type of organization that government's set up to be, which is it always, uh, it doesn't reward success, but always uh, rewards failure, you know, like failure people get noticed for and can get fired. Um, this is the way you, you get folks' attention on that. So I'm going to leave it to you to wrap, Waldo. Sure. Okay. And I, I also just want to thank Catherine. Like that was, that was a great question. It really just cut, cut, cut to the heart of things about like, okay, but how, how do you do this? Um, so here's just a, a few few takeaways, uh, I, I think, that getting this stuff right requires transformation that goes clear back to the budgeting process, but all the way forward through procurement to how these, these things are executed. And it requires that legislative budgeting staffs learn about agile and use center design and so on, like not just the, the agency, not just the folk executing this, but the, all the way back to the, to the legislature so they can give up forking over these huge dollar values in exchange for these periodic reports that will always claim everything is great. Legislators and their staffs, they tell us they hate funding these things in the current way. They provide the funding and then they just pray that it doesn't crash and burn because they have no control other than how much money that they give. So by being able to fund this stuff incrementally, only giving more money if things are going well, and being able to monitor the work as it's being done, they can fund with far more confidence. Uh, and, and that to me seems like it's pretty great for, for everybody. Um, I, I, as we wrap up here, I wanna thank our backstage team, uh, Ori and, and Taylor and Corey and Vandana and Divjot um, for doing all the work in the background so we could just talk here. I, I appreciate the, the work of the crew here. Um, and I wanna thank Vicky and Mark for joining us from ATNF and of course my colleague Robin for <laughs> joining as well. Uh, I, I've enjoyed this chance to talk things through.